concluding our message series. It's been one of the shorter ones, but on the book of Jonah, we've been taking a look at one chapter every week. And just to kind of summarize what we've looked at so far, in week number one, we saw that Jonah figured out you can run from God, but even though we can run from God, the reality is, is we can't hide from him. In week number two, we saw that Jonah was swallowed up by that big stinky fish and, and, and he calls out to God from it. And, and at times we may find ourselves in the belly of a big stinky fish in life and we should uh, call out to God as well as he will hear our prayers. Last week, we talked about the importance of surrendering to God. Remember, Jonah was trying to flee from God and, and not follow God's uh, word as it came to him, but he finally surrendered. And this morning, I want to talk to you about repentance and with repentance, the forgiveness that comes from God. Now, just to kind of recap where we've been at with the story of Jonah, remember the word of the Lord came to Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach its destruction because it was a very wicked city. But Jonah didn't want to go, and we still don't know why Jonah didn't want to go. We're, we're actually going to find out in chapter 4 why it was Jonah didn't want to go. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, and he goes 3,000 miles in the other direction, or at least tries to, and he's headed to Tarshish. He boards a boat, and while he's on the, this boat, a great storm comes up, and the boat is about to be destroyed. Uh, the sailors were somewhat superstitious. They figured there was a reason why the boat was going to be destroyed, so they tried to determine who was responsible. It turns out they realized Jonah was responsible, and so reluctantly, they throw Jonah overboard, and once Jonah's thrown overboard, the waves are going over his head. He's about to drown. God sends this big old fish that comes and gulps him up, and then he ends up spending the next three days and three nights in the belly of the fish as that fish swims him in the direction that God intended him to go all along, vomits him up on the land. And once he's been vomited up on the land, Jonah cleans himself off and heads into the city of Nineveh. And it's a very large city. And it takes him three days to, to navigate the city and declare the message that it was going to be destroyed. And when they hear Jonah's message, they decide, you know what? We messed up, and if, if we repent, maybe God will relent and he'll forgive us. God does, and Jonah is none too happy about it, all right? So that's the backstory, and that picks up where we're at today in Jonah chapter 4. And so Jonah's not happy that God's not going to destroy Nineveh anymore, and so, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. In fact, Jonah became very angry and he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is why I tried forestalling fleeing to Tarshish. For I, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. You're a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah had gone out now, and he had sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, and he sat in the shade, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. <laughs> then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, and he made it grow up, over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy with the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed up the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it, and you didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should I have not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right hand from their left, and many animals. 
And here it is. We finally find out in chapter 4 why it is Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh. It's not that he's just trying to be difficult. It's not that he's just trying to be disobedient. He just thinks this is going to be an epic waste of time. It's like if your boss tells you to go work on this project that's going to take like three weeks to complete and you know that even once you complete it, they're not going to do anything with it, you're not going to be real happy about it. And, and that's kind of what, what, what Jonah's dealing with. He knows that like, he's going to go to Nineveh, he's going to do everything that God says, and God is going to ultimately relent because God is slow to anger, he, he, he abounds in love, he's gracious, he's compassionate, and he's going to look like a fool. Because in the end, he's going to preach its destruction and God's not going to destroy it. And that's exactly what happened. And Jonah's so mad about this, he wants to die. Why is he like wanting to die? Because this is just an utter waste of time. And now he's looking like a fool in front of the Ninevites because he said something's going to happen that, 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 that isn't going to happen. And more than that, he hates the Ninevites. He hates the Ninevites and now God is going to show compassion on him and he wanted to see him destroyed. So God decides to give Jonah a little sermon illustration. And the sermon illustration goes like this. In the middle of Jonah's temper tantrum and, and, and being angry at the Lord, uh, God causes this plant to grow up, and it's a big plant. And, and, and listen, it's hot there, and, 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 and the sun is hot, and there's no trees. And so this plant actually gives Jonah shade because he withdrew from the city because in his heart of hearts, he's hoping God's still going to destroy it. He's popped his popcorn. He's got his lemonade. He's hanging out, and he's waiting to see what's going to happen. And God was gracious and gives us plant that's giving shade to his head. And, and he goes to sleep, but, but that night God provides a worm that, that eats through that plant. And, and, and when he wakes up, the plant's no longer there. And, and now the scorching sun's on him, the, the harsh wind is on him, and, and he's angry about that. And God's point to Jonah is this, listen, you're upset about a plant. You're upset about a plant that you didn't plant. You're upset about a plant that you didn't make grow. Here I am. I've got 120,000 people that are mine. I put them there. They're, they're my creation. They're my kids. I, I, I've made them grow. I've made them prosper. And you don't think I care more about 120,000 people than you do about a plant? And Jonah had no answer for the Lord, of course. So whatever happens to, to Jonah after this Nineveh encounter, uh, we all know. He's actually mentioned in one other, other place in Scripture. So he, he literally was a prophet of the Lord. The Lord used him more than once. But we don't know what happened to him, but we are able to place when he was a prophet because of this passage in the Scripture from 2 Kings. Look at 2 Kings chapter 14.25. It says, he was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lalo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through who? Spoken, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. So there we see Jonah mentioned in one other place. That's all we have from scripture of Jonah. We don't know what happens to him after this whole Nineveh thing. So what's the lesson that we get from chapter 4 of Jonah? This is the lesson that we get. Sometimes we get upset at the Lord's compassion. Now, let, let's face it. Isn't this like root of Jonah? I mean, Jonah is literally mad, so mad he wants to die because God ends up not destroying 120,000 people. I, I mean, that, that like is beyond comprehension that a prophet of God would be that shallow and, and that angry at, at God for, for not killing. All. I mean, that's a lot of people to die, 120,000. But the truth is, is we would have felt the same. I guarantee we would have felt the same. And you don't think so, but let me explain it to you. How many of us in here have ever been angry because we've been shown compassion? How many of you have been pulled over by a police officer? You're doing 80 and a 60. He pulls you over and he says, you know, I could have given you a ticket, but I'm not going to slow down. How many of you have been like, no, 
No, we're like, really? Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, I guess like, we love compassion. We love mercy when it's for us. But, but what about that person that passes you going 100 in a, in, in, a, in a 70, and when they pass you, it kind of startles you, and you're sitting there thinking, man, I hope there's a cop ahead. And sure enough, a mile up the road, there was a cop ahead, but he never pulled him over. You're sitting there, and you're mad about it. You wanted that person to get pulled over. Every so often, some judge does some ludicrous jail sentence where it basically gives someone far less than what they deserve, and you and I were angry about that. Politicians on the other side of the spectrum, if the Department of Justice isn't investigating them, if they seem to be giving them a lighter sentence than what they deserve, we're angry about that. You see, we've got a double standard when it comes to mercy. If it's for us, we love it. If it's for someone we like and know, we love it. If it's for someone we don't care about, we can't stand it. And this is Jonah. These are the, the Ninevites. They're evil, wicked people, and he doesn't like it at all that God's let them off. And I promise you, you wouldn't have either. You know, the Bible's filled with stories of, of people not appreciating the mercy of God. We, we see it here in the story of Jonah, but we see it in, in honestly, the life of Jesus. Because th that's the problem, like when Jesus came into the world, in the same way like that Jonah didn't like the dirty, stinking Ninevites, uh, the, 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 the religious leaders in Jesus' day didn't like the fact that Jesus would hang out with the sinners. Now, what's it mean, the sinners? Listen, we all sin. Every one of us in here is a sinner. But when the Bible uses the term sinners, it's usually referring to people that like are involved in what they considered worse sins and they're doing it all the time and they don't even care. And they don't like the fact that Jesus was reaching out to them and they don't like that Jesus was promising God's mercy to them. Look at Luke 15, one to two. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. You see, they're no different than Jonah and they're no different than you and I. There's certain people that are worthy of the mercy and the forgiveness of God in our minds and there's certain people that aren't. You know, we have two different kinds of problems in the church today when it comes to understanding the mercy of God. The larger problem in the church today is this, that people say and teach, God, God loves everyone. And, and he, he, he forgives you, he accepts you just as you are. That is a common message across most of Christianity today, and it's wrong. But on the other side of the spectrum, and I think more you and I are gonna fall into this, is this view that like God's mercy is only for a certain type of people. And there's some people that aren't deserving of it. Your son goes and studies abroad in Egypt at a university there, some cross-cultural thing. An ISIS group goes in and uh, invades the university, pulls out 20 or so Christians that were studying there, your son being one of them, and cuts their heads off. I don't really think that you're going to be wanting to hear that God can somehow have mercy on the person that did that to your son. A gunman enter, enters the school or a school, elementary school, and kills a classroom full of kids. You rush to get to the school. You can do nothing about it. And you find out that your child is one of the ones that was killed. I don't think you want to hear any hope or any chance of that gunman receiving the mercy of God. A drunk driver hits your car one evening. You guys haven't been drinking, but it struck your car and killed either your child, your spouse, maybe your parent who's riding with you. Uh, certainly for a great amount of time, you probably don't want to think the thought that somehow that person can be in heaven, will be in heaven, and that they can receive the mercy of God. If we're going to be honest about it, some of y'all have problems with the idea that there's going to be a Democrat in heaven. 
a coworker. A, a, a coworker accuses you of doing something you didn't do that causes you to not only lose your job, but now they get the promotion that you deserve. A coworker sleeps with a boss, gets the promotion that you deserve, and you've lost your job as a result. I, I don't think, at least for a, a, a significant amount of time, you really want to see that person in heaven and think that God will somehow have mercy on them. Uh, my point is this, is there are a lot of different scenarios in which in our minds, we don't think certain people are worthy or deserve serving on the mercy of God. It, but I said there, there, there's two errors in the church. There's those that think some people aren't, aren't worthy of the mercy of God. But, but the other side is like uh, believing that, 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 that God will just forgive everyone and everything. Uh, does God forgive everyone? No, actually he doesn't. Can he? Yes. Does he? No. That's not what we see when we look at Scripture. The world would say, yes, God accepts you just as you are. It's okay that you're this. It's okay that you're that. God forgives you. Actually, no, he doesn't. Look at the story of Jonah and Nineveh. Why did God relent from destroying Nineveh? It's because Nineveh repented. God was sending a prophet there to preach its destruction. It would have been destroyed. It was going to be destroyed in 40 days. There's one reason and one reason only. Nineveh was not destroyed, and it's because the people of Nineveh repented. And people are like, well, that's just the Old Testament. It's, 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 just, it's not that way elsewhere in the Bible. Well, actually it is. You know, so many people have this understanding that the God of the Old Testament somehow acts differently than the God of the New. Listen, God doesn't have a bad memory. I do, he doesn't. Like, he remembers how he was. And the Bible says he's the same yesterday as he is today and he is tomorrow. He's not like a God of a different personality, old and new. Even when we look in the New Testament, God still requires repentance. Can God forgive everything? Yes. Does he? No. He only forgives that which people will repent. Jonah was a prophet of God called to preach destruction to, to Nineveh, but because Nineveh repented, God relented and he forgave him. Jesus is the ultimate prophet. He's much more. He's also our savior. But Jesus is the ultimate prophet of God that is preaching repentance to, to, to the, the entire earth. And for those who repent, they receive God's forgiveness. It's it's repeated throughout the New Testament. Look at Mark chapter 2, 15 to 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many of the tax collectors and the sinners, they were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. Now, when the religious leaders, when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors? Why is he eating with the sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it isn't the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come to what? Call I've not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. Jesus came to call the sinners. What does it mean to call the sinners? He comes into this world to call the sinners to repentance. I mean, otherwise he doesn't even have to come in. It's just all good. They'll be forgiven. But no, the only reason the Ninevites existed after Jonah preached was because they repented. And Jesus has called the, 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 the sick and the sinners to repent. Look at Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. They're lost. He's trying to bring them back. How does he bring them back? By, by calling them to repentance. You know, we love to throw stories out in the Bible that show Jesus as being this all-accepting figure. Uh, yeah, Pastor Greg, there's that woman that was caught in adultery that was about to be stoned. That just shows God accepts people where they're at. Actually, no. He, he does stop. You know, he, he says, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. He tells the woman, like, you know, who's going to condemn you? Well, then neither will I. But then he says what? He says, go now and leave your life of sin. That's repentance. Zacchaeus, right? He's that tax collector that was great at ripping people off. 
He became rich by like telling you you owed 550 bucks when you only owed 150, and he kept the difference. Jesus doesn't say to Zacchaeus, man, dude, I love how you can just con people. I mean, it's all good. He doesn't say that. He comes and he calls Zacchaeus to repentance. And what does Zacchaeus do? He says, like, Lord, if I've ripped anyone off, I'm going to give them back four times, four times what I've ever stolen from them. Folks, like that's repentance. And, and it's when he declares that he's going to stop doing it and he's going to make right, more than right, everything that he did that was wrong. That's when Jesus says, salvation has come to the house of this man. The, this false understanding that God just accepts us in, in our, our sinfulness and he doesn't care, that is not biblical. It's not biblical in the Old Testament. It's not biblical in the New Testament. Look at John 5, 1 to 14. Now, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem from one of the Jewish festivals. And there, there, there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the, the, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and had learned that he, he had been in this condition for such a long time, Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I don't, I don't have anyone to help me to get in the pool once the water has been stirred. Well, while I'm trying to get in, someone always gets in ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat, and he walked. Now the day in which this miracle took place was a Sabbath. And the Jewish leaders didn't like that, and they said to the man who had been healed, it's a Sabbath, and it forbids you from carrying your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, who, who's this fellow that told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd, in the crowd that was there. Now later, Jesus found this man at the temple, and he said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse will happen to you. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. That's the message of Jesus. And it, and we just have forgotten that in the church today. We don't talk about that part of it. We just try to get cheap grace. We get forgiveness without repentance. We see amongst the Ninevites what, what real repentance is and true repentance is. I said this last week. I'm like, y'all think the big story about like Jonah and the, and the whale, Jonah and the big fish is the fact that this big fish gulped up Jonah and he lived for three days in its belly before he's vomited out. Don't get me wrong, that, that, that's miraculous. But what's more miraculous than that is that you've got these evil, wicked people. These aren't children of Abraham. They, they have no relationship with God, but yet a prophet of God comes to them and declares that they're gonna be destroyed and they repent. Listen, Israel, time again, when the prophets would come to Israel, Israel would not listen to their own prophets but these wicked, evil, stinky Ninevites did. That's the real miracle here. And they show us what true repentance is. They stopped doing the evil that they knew. They knew all along in their hearts what they were doing was evil. They stopped doing it. But not only do they stop inwardly, but they show outwardly that they're, they're repentant. And, and, and that's where, like, they, they put on sackcloth. Not only do they, but, like, all the animals are put in sackcloth. It's just this uncomfortable, you know, potato sack type clothing to show sincerity of, of one's change that's taking place. They sit in the dirt 
and they throw dirt upon themselves to show that they know that, that they're covered in sin. They fast because Jesus says if man doesn't live by bread alone, but on the word of God. And, and if you can control that which is coming into your mouth, you can control that which is coming out of your body. It's a discipline. It's a spiritual, a di spiritual discipline. If you can go a full day without eating, two days without eating, three days without eating, then you're not being governed by your emotions. You're not being governed by your feelings. You're not being governed by your, your appetite, your hunger, whatever. You know, you're being governed by your faith and, you, and, and your, your commitment to God. That's what we see here amongst the Ninevites. You know, one of the greatest sins in the church today is its failure to talk about repentance. And repentance is, is just vital to being able to receive forgiveness. On Wednesday nights, I've been teaching this class called The Great Apostasy, and it's, it's coming to terms with, are we in that time in which the church is falling away from God in, in, in the faith? And I think in many respects, at least in Europe and in America, we are. You know, we all get upset about what the governments might do to us, and we should be concerned. We all get upset about what the media, you know, their influence that they have or corporations. And it's not that we shouldn't be concerned about those things, but we're given a pass to the church. And the author said, what's going on in the church is like termites from within. And if you've ever had termites, what happens is, you know, behind the wall, you can't tell the what the termites are doing. I mean, structurally, the, 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 the door frame or the, you know, drywall looks like it's intact. Or, or your wood pile out back until you go grab it or you push on it and your hand goes right through it, right? And it's been eaten from the inside out. That's what's going on in the church today is like it's been attacked from within and there's a shell of what the church looks like. It looks like a church. It might smell like a church. Uh, they might sing like a church, but, but, but it, isn't, it isn't the bride of Christ anymore because it's been rotten from the inside out. Here's the good news of the story of Jonah and the Ninevites is that, you know, if God can forgive the Ninevites, God can forgive any of us. In fact, I, I, would, I would challenge you with this. There is no sin so great. There's only one sin that God won't forgive, and that's unbelief. Every other sin God will forgive, he just wants us to repent of it. And the struggle is this, is like sometimes we don't even know that we're sinning when we're sinning. Sometimes we sin by things we do. Sometimes we think we sin by, by, you know, what we don't do. Sometimes it's just feelings that we carry in our heart. But the good news is this, like we don't have to remember all sin. I love what Jesus says, right? Jesus says this from the cross. You know, the, the people are crucifying Jesus because in their mind, they think they're protecting the faith. They think that what they're doing is right, but what they're actually doing is, is sinning. And so Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't even know what it is that they're doing. Jesus will intercede on our behalf when when we sin and repent, and even when we repent of what we don't even realize that it is that we're doing. Look at Psalm 103, 10 to 13. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is for the west, so far as he removed our transgressions, that is our sin from us. How far is the east from the west? I mean, it, it, it's the, without end, the east is from the west. That is how far he's removed our sin from us. For as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord will have compassion on those who fear him. So listen, I don't know what you've done in your past, but no sin's so great that God cannot and will not forgive. God has forgiven you as long as you repent. So if you have, forgive yourself. And I know that the goal in life is this. We, we all want to get to that point where, where we don't sin, but we'll never reach that point because the scripture says, listen, if we, if we say we don't sin, we're just lying to ourselves. We're making God out to be a liar. So even though we're trying hard to not anymore and we need to try not to, we're always going to fail and we're always going to make a mistake. But here we are a couple weeks from the Lenten season and the Lenten season is when we're supposed to really focus on where we're failing 
excelling in, in, in what we do, in following Christ and, and in our life of obedience. And, and so we need to really focus on the sin that, that, we, that we realize that we have a problem with. And for some of us, it's our pride. And, and we need to really try to bury that. For some of us, we're just extremely judgmental. And, and we need to stop being so judgmental, thinking that somehow we and the people we like are deserving of mercy and not others. For some of us, it's a promiscuousness or a lustfulness. For some of us, we just get angry very easily. For some of us like to gossip and talk about other people and hear what's going on in other people's lives. For some of us, we're just envious. And for some of us, we're gluttonous. For some of us, we're materialistic. And, and then there's the obvious ones, right? Some of us are struggling with addictions and drunkenness and so forth. There's a lot of different things that we could be struggling with, uh, but we, we need to uh, come before God and confess those sins, those which we know that we're sinning and those in which we don't. Because if, if, if we confess them, if we, if we repent of them, if we desire to change, God forgives all sin. What I want to do now is I want to take a time to for us to read together a confession of sin. You know, it's really interesting. When I started out in the ministry, I've, heard, I've gotten a lot of compliments on the fact that I've done this, uh, what I'm about to do with you guys next uh, in the first couple of services. But I have to be honest with you, when I started ministry, everything was always so ritualistic and everything was always so formal that like when you say the Lord's Prayer every week, it doesn't mean anything and people don't think anything about it. And then you could have formal confession and absolution where you read certain things out of the hymnal. And because everyone just like did it every week and didn't think about it. I didn't like that and it didn't seem real and genuine. And, and so I've pushed back on a lot of that stuff. And so, you know, I, we do the Lord's Prayer once a week. I'll do sort of a confession type thing on uh, communion Sundays where I'll say, scripture says we're all sinners. Do you confess you're your sinner? You say that you do. And, and we just acknowledge it together, right? But, but this comes from like our hymnal. And, and, and some of you are gonna be familiar with this. Most of you aren't, but I wanna read it together because it's a beautiful uh, way of, of summarizing all the sin that we have, the stuff that we realize that we have and, and the sin that we don't. And so let us come together as a body of Christ this morning and let's read this together. And after we're done confessing our sin to one another and to God, then I'm gonna close us in prayer. Uh, so would you read with me? Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Would you join me in word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, we just thank and praise you for this message series on Jonah, and I pray that the different topics as we've looked at them over the last month, that um, they would continue to speak to us and, and that we'd be able to apply them to our lives. But as we concluded this morning on, on repentance and forgiveness, I, I pray first and foremost, merciful God, that we wouldn't have a double standard that we wouldn't be willing to receive the, the, the mercy of others in your mercy and like Jonah be angered to see other people who don't seem to deserve it, to receive it. I pray, gracious God, that all of us in here have different dysfunctions that we've been living in and um, different sins that, that, that we need to weed out of our hearts and out of our lives. Merciful God, as Paul says, sometimes our spirit's willing. It's just that the flesh is weak. Help us, gracious God, um, as we enter into the season of Lent here in a couple weeks. To be aware of, of, the, of the sin that we have in our lives, give us the strength by the power of the Holy Spirit to, to really try to root it out of our lives. Help us, gracious God, where we sin and we're not even aware that we're sinning, that you open our eyes to it. But help us also, gracious God, to forgive ourselves 
as we know that as we come before you in repentance, that you forgive us and that we also should forgive ourselves. We pray all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.